Our next speaker is Sam Gindin. Sam Gindin spent most of his working life in the trade union movement as research director of the Canadian Auto Workers. He is the co-author with Leo Panich, who's here, of The Making of Global Capitalism. I think this is a great book. It's really important, and its importance is, and I think uh, Umar said it, its importance is that it, it pushes the discussion. Sorry. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah, the importance of Naomi's book is that it it pushes the discussion higher and it pushes the discussion forward. And I, I want to talk about a few of the things that I really liked about the book. I want to talk about some of the limits of it. And I want to conclude with a limit of all of us, I think. It's not just in the book. Uh, one of the things that Naomi does that's important is take on the question of green capitalism. And it's not that there aren't positive things that can happen within capitalism in terms of green capitalism or in terms of carbon taxes and uh, you know, the institution where the most technological studies of the environment are taking place right now is in the Department of Defense in the US because they're trying to figure out how to deal with the fact that uh, oil is right now it's cheap but it's not really not cheap but it's expensive because you have to get it to where you're going and that means all kinds of security questions pipelines, etc. So they're actually doing serious research on it. But the point is that we have, to, we have to think about the scale of the problem that we're talking about. And this problem can't be solved unless we're talking about structural changes. That means unless we're talking about changes in power in society, unless we're actually addressing this question of pri private property control over our economy, unless we're actually talking about how will we have planning you have to plan to deal with the environment, how do you have that in this kind of society? And unless we're talking about changes in values, and not just the changes in values of capitalists, but the changes in values of workers and of ourselves. Uh, the second thing that's so important about what Naomi is doing is she's taking on this bias uh, in parts of the movement uh, for structuralness. This bias in favor of spontaneity, uh, which she calls the fetish of structuralness goes back to a debate that was in the women's movement in the early 70s. Uh, and the point is, uh, we should be honest about where we're at in terms of the strength of the movement right now. Uh, there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of creativity, but we don't have a mass movement. And to build a mass movement, it means that we actually have to talk about how do we mobilize resources that we're going to need, how do we do outreach in a systematic way? We've hardly made any inroads into the working class, the organized working class in particular, but not just the organized working class. How do we coordinate across the movement? How do we establish some continuity so we don't just have ups and downs depending on what's happening? How do we actually have accountability so we can make some decisions collectively that are democratic and how can we carry out those decisions? A third thing that uh, Naomi emphasizes that is cr critical is that we aren't going to win this fight on the basis of throwing out fear. She makes the point that fear can just as easily paralyze people. And this is very much what we've seen. Fear isn't uh, enough. And it isn't enough to just concentrate on the environment. If we're going to create the kind of movement that can make the large changes that we're talking about, it's going to have to be a much larger movement with a larger vision of the kind of society we want that addresses all, all kinds of other issues. Uh, so just, just for example, I mean, one of the strengths of the, tar, of, of the tar sands movement is that it isn't just about the environment. It's about indigenous rights. It's about our place within the American empire. It's about a particular strategy for economic development. Um, on Tuesday, there's going to be a meeting, I think at Steelworkers Hall, on breast cancer. Uh, of women, rates of which are rising astronomically in the auto parts industry. Well, that, that's an issue we have to talk about, partly because it's about the environment as well, but because we have to talk about those kinds of issues. We have to talk about all kinds of uh, social justice issues. Leo was mentioning uh, as we were walking over here, uh, you know, starvation. Why is that less important than talking about the environment? There are all kinds of immediate issues, and organizing people is going to involve us addressing immediate issues in their daily lives, <coughs> linking them to the environment, but above all, linking them to a larger uh, structure and issues. The limits of the book, uh, one of them, which I don't want to spend too much time talking on, is there's a tendency sometimes in all of Naomi's books 
to emphasize ideology as if it stands alone. But ideology exists in a context, and ideology, it's important. Education is always important. How we frame our stories is important. But ideology exists in a context uh, of power relationships, and we have to keep remembering that. Ideology, it's limited. It plays a role, but it has to be in a context. Mike? Sorry. More important, yeah, keep doing, keep doing that if I, my arm slips. Uh, more important is the fact that uh, she's inconsistent on the question of capitalism. Uh, often she, uh, what she's saying is completely about capitalism, not about a bad capitalism, not about neoliberalism, not about uh, deregulation, but about capitalism per se. The kind of society that capitalism is, is the problem, but then she fades into the trap of thinking, of, of suggesting that a better capitalism might be the answer. The question is, well, why is this important? It's important for a number of reasons. First of all, we really do have to understand what we're up against. We should have no illusions about what we're up against. If we're going to solve the environmental crisis, we're going to have to end capitalism and talk about socialism. Second of all, once we recognize that, we have to address the question of the state. It's also something that movements, not just the environment movement, tend to stay away from. You protest, you fight against the state, but the recognition that you can't just leave the state there if you're going to change power, that you actually have to take it over, transform it into a democratic institution, transform it into something that is truly democratic in the sense of facilitating our capacities to run our lives and our society is absolutely crucial. And above all, once, once you recognize that capitalism is the problem, it really challenges us in terms of how we think about organizing. Well, how do we have to organize if it isn't just changing one particular policy, but is actually changing a system? The other thing about the limit of Naomi's book, and I want to raise this with, with a lot of humility, because I, 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 uh, I've been challenged on this a lot, and it's a very difficult question. The question is, Naomi did, of course, a lot of alternatives forth. Um, and the issue, you know, one of the reasons it's important is that even if we get rid of capitalism, that's a necessary condition, but it doesn't mean that socialism will necess necessarily solve the environmental problem unless we actually talk about those kinds of alternatives and fight for them. Alternatives are also important because it gives people a sense of hope, and it's part of mobilizing. But again, as Umar said, we should be careful about exaggerating this. So for example, we always talk about, we're going to go to workers and tell them that there's going to be a just transition. So if you lose your job, don't worry, there'll be another job and we'll protect your income. Well, that's abstract for workers. They don't believe it. There's nothing in their experience that suggests that if they lose their job and the left says, don't worry about it, there'll be a job transition, anything is going to happen. Uh, you know, the reality of workers' lives over the last while is they've been demoralized, demobilized, and they've been suffering defeats. Uh, on the other hand, there are important things that the left has always been saying that I think we have to revive in talking about uh, the environment. And I think they have some potential for mobilizing. I want to raise a, a, a few of them. Um, one, is the, one of them is the question of conversion in the auto industry. Uh, the, the reason that it's possible to talk about it right now is that the structure of the auto industry, since neoliberalism began, hasn't provided, in fact, security for working people. So they're open to some discussion. General Motors uh, employed 450,000 people at the end of the 70s. It's about 100,000 today. 80% of the jobs gone. There's no way that their defense of the auto industry is going to give them security, and you can't argue for more cars. What we have to be talking about is that there are productive capacities here, skills of workers, machinery and equipment, that can be put to socially useful purposes, especially if we think that everything about our society is going to have to be restructured, materially restructured, if we're serious about the environment. That that's what's going to have to happen in terms of the century. So it, it, it's, it's changing the focus from talking about electric cars or whether auto workers should be lobbying for sales tax decreases that can increase cars to actually talking about how we use those productive capacities in a different way. And it begins a discussion that isn't about how, we, how our work is going to be competitive, but about social use, not about profits, about solidarity, and about democratic economic planning. The other thing, which is I, I think is actually quite easy, is there's all kinds of things being said about, in, in terms of the restructuring of the society, in terms of infrastructure, 
uh, that uh, would fit into uh, jobs in the construction industry. Construction workers have also been kicked around in terms of unions and standards, and there's all kinds of possibilities when you talk about how, how we're going to be restructuring everything, our cities, housing, everything, uh, in terms of the construction industry. And in the public sector, the, the issues that the public sector is facing in terms of austerity, there is no way for the public sector to fight back to protect its gains if it isn't actually linking itself in a class way to the rest of society. If it isn't actually positioning itself as leading the fight for the expansion of public services. And in leading a fight that says we want to expand public services and public spaces, what they're putting on the agenda is a different kind of growth, different kinds of values. The comments that people talked about, uh, collective uh, collective spaces and collective uh, consumption. Uh, the other things that the left has always talked about has been work time and guaranteed annual income. And those are great things, but we should be careful about them. Uh, work time can just mean that you have more time to consume. When Japanese workers went from a six-day week to a five-day week, golf courses doubled. Uh, aren't a great use of uh, nature for, for the environment. So, so you, 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 we can't escape this question uh, of values. And the same goes for a guaranteed annual income. If we're going to talk about a guaranteed annual income, especially in regards to the global south, we're talking about people with a lot more to spend. Well, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with the transfer of resources from us to them, uh, in addition to transfers within our society? So let me, let me, um, uh, let me try to summarize what I'm trying to get at here. One is that most of our discussions on the environment start off with a question of urgency. Something has to happen quick. And, and I want to argue, and it's hard to argue this, uh, personally, that there just aren't any shortcuts. There's nothing that's going to solve the environmental crisis over the next while. We have to confront this fact. Uh, you know, we, we've had the problem of inequality growing over the last 20 years, and we all complain about it, we all lament it, and nothing has actually changed that. This is a question of actually developing capacities, and, and to frame it in terms of urgency can even be dangerous. And I think you see this in a lot of the free movement and people looking to solutions within capitalism, like making pollution into a commodity that you can buy and sell and hope that the market solves it. That, that sense of urgency and the sense of exhaustion because we haven't been winning leads people to look for easy solutions. There aren't any easy solutions. What really, you know, the importance of Naomi's book in terms of saying this changes everything is the scale of what needs to be changed. And that's what we have to think about. And the scale of what needs to be changed has to involve creating structures through which people can fight. They can have all the great ideas that are out there, but if people don't have confidence in the structures that exist, which they don't, they don't have them in their unions, they don't have them in their in political parties, and people come in and out of the movements as well. There have to be structures that uh, are deep in a way that we haven't really contemplated, and we have to be engaged in struggles all the time. And it's only through struggles that these kinds of, you know, when we start to talk about people changing their values, uh, moving from individualism to a collective sense of struggle, that only can happen through struggles. It's not about lecturing people and telling them it would be better if they thought collectively. Those are the kind of things that you learn when you're actually in struggle. When you're in struggle, you see that new things are possible. You begin to see what needs to be changed. You change your relationships to each other. Uh, and, and there's a different sense of international solidarity. I mean, to imagine what would need to happen in terms of resources being moved from the global north to the global south, uh, and solidarity of people agreeing to that, that means, first of all, an enormous change in the global north, in terms of power and attitudes, but it also means a change in the global south. If we just transferred resources to the global south, we shouldn't romanticize the global south. So their states get it. What convinces us that that will be used in a way that is either egalitarian or actually deals with the environment, rather than to promote competitiveness or whatever? So, so uh, what we're facing is the reality that just as the world has gotten a lot more unequal, it's going to get a lot uglier. 
the urgency is to begin to organize to address this. And as we organize, we have to fight for whatever we can to change within capitalism. All those reforms are absolutely crucial. But we also have to be sober and recognize that if we really want to transform this, we're going to have to talk about moving beyond capitalism. And that means that wherever, whatever we're doing, whatever, however we're organizing, we're all, we always have to ask ourselves, what does this have to do with developing the understandings and capacities to move beyond the system that we have right now? Thank you.